And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. That was great. Guys, let's put our word of the month in the chat. Let's get our positivity going. And uh, Paul, welcome to the Six Amherst. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's, it's, it's wonderful. I, You know, this is so much better than starting the day with Jim Cramer. It's <laughs> so much better, right? So much it's, less uh, anger, like, you know, some some positivity, some conversation about the beaches, you know. So anyways, Paul, I know um, I, I as I, I left you a voicemail last night, but uh, just, just so you know, this is like me and you grabbing a cup of coffee. That's great. I got my Christmas mug right here. So, Paul, if you don't mind, give everyone a quick introduction, like a little bit about who you are and a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm a, a, a fellow that uh, lived a life of being a workaholic and uh, retired at age 40 uh, after having worked very hard, uh, promising never to be a workaholic again. And I started a little company that was giving advice to people on how to invest, uh, focused mostly on teaching people how to do it on their own. And uh, if they didn't want to do it on their own, I was happy to do it for them. But what started out as a, just a, a pure hobby turned out to be an actual business. And I did that for 30 years. And I retired about a decade ago. I took a part of what I got for selling the company. And I started a new foundation that is focused on financial education for all. From the point that a baby is born to the point that a person passes uh, I am trying as best I can with a great group of people who, who, uh, who, who give hundreds of hours of free time every year to help people do it on their own. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. By the way, I was asked who sent me here. I had a brain fog that uh, I lost it. And during the meditation, I remembered it was Eric Prine, of course, and uh, <laughs> but I needed that meditation to get there. I appreciated that. But I, I am simply, uh, and and by the way, when I did start this foundation, I promised my wife I would never work for money again, and I have held that promise. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what she heard, and this happens in marriages, that I would never work again. And when I told her I was now getting up to, to do this here this morning, she said, you're crazy. But <laughs> I tell you, I love every day of what I'm doing in helping other people. And what a joy it is to be here to help. You know, I know that one or two or three or four, a, a small group of people will hear this and they'll get my free book and they'll read it. And I really believe it'll change their life. So that's why I'm here and that's what I do. It's amazing. So tons of questions about what you're doing right now, but maybe just to set us up earlier, like what was your first job? Like, so you said you retired at 40. What were you doing up until that point when then you launched your company that you were a workaholic? Well, I, 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 I've been in a number uh, of companies. In fact, I came out of uh, the university and became a stockbroker. Yeah. And uh, it only took me a couple of years to realize the conflicts of interest. And I left and did a whole bunch of things. But the thing I did right before I started the investment advisory company was a company in the Seattle area was going bankrupt. And I was asked to go in and uh, and see if I could solve it. And uh, and. In a sense, I did. Actually, the employees solved it. I just allow the employees to have their say in the process, and it worked. Um, but from that, I was able to basically retire, um, which, of course, was a silly thing for me to think because, again, you know how workaholics are. I'm sure you've got a couple of them here on, <laughs> on, on site right now. And, uh, and so that's what led me into this. It had nothing to do with what I do. In fact, nobody knew me as an investment advisor when I started. So uh, that literally, because it was a hobby, my minimum size account that you had to have in order to get my personal service for a year was $2,000. That was yeah. not my fee. That was how much money I would help you with. My fee was 1%, which in essence meant 
that I was willing to work for you for a year for $20. So it, it, it was not uh, a profit-driven organization, yeah. but it turned out to be in the end by and not on purpose. And I'm glad it was. That's awesome. Awesome. So, so take us back 10 years ago. Um, you, you sell your company. Um, and then what was the motivation to start your current organization? That's, that is a, is, is it a nonprofit or is it? Yes, it is a nonprofit. Uh, and, and really I have to credit my wife for having, uh, egged me on, uh, because we had this amount of money that I wanted to invest in other people and, uh, or or give, I mean, invest in terms of devote some energy to it. It started out with the idea of leaving some sort of a fund at Western Washington University uh, where uh, I was an alumni. And she said, come on, you can do better than that. And so what we came up with was to take a portion of the money that was put into the foundation every year to support a class at Western and a class that I've never seen in another university. It's a class devoted to investing for non-finance majors. Mm -hmm. And that class has been full every quarter since it first started in 2013. Yeah. And now we're working on getting, uh, in essence, a class for all 15,000 people who come uh, through uh, Western, and every one of them will walk out of there, I hope, know how to invest their 401k, understand how mortgages work, understand how to protect yourself financially, and to think critically uh, ab about the, the whole process of your money, because there is no industry where they are any more clever in, 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 in getting at what they want than the money people. So uh, I want people to take care of themselves, which is what your organization seems to be about. Yeah. That yeah. phrase, uh, selfish. Healthy selfish. Healthy selfish. I love that phrase. I think that is uh, uh, wonderful. And, and I'm a firm believer in enough is not enough. And the reason I say that is because every one of us starts out with well, most of us anyway, with a plan. Yep. And the idea is if we save this much money, we get accomplish these things in our life, whether it's for others or for ourselves, for our family. But the fact is, when I got married at 19, I really thought I was going to be married one time for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it turned out, and that was my plan. Sure. sure. It turned out once didn't work. And so... <laughs> It turned out enough wasn't enough. So I really think that it's not for greedy purposes that I want people to have more than enough or plan for it. I want it because I think you do that, maybe you end up with enough, which is what I would like for everybody. It's amazing. But Paul, where where does that the altruism or the this desire to help people, where where does it come from? Did it was there a moment like did something happen? Was it saying in you all along? Like where where was the um, the uh, the inspiration to just help people like the way you are? Well, it was a, a, a kind of a random event, as most of our life is actually a series. And uh, my mother, who's one of the sweetest people, nicest people on earth, uh, married uh, my stepfather, who was at the other end of the spectrum. Mm. And I hated every minute at home. In fact, one of the greatest days of my life was the day that I found out that my stepfather was my stepfather because at age 11, I thought he was my father. And uh, I found out that he was my stepfather. I kind of understood everything. Uh, but the fact is, is that because of my fear of him, I figured every way I could to get out of the house. Mm. And getting out of the house was whether it was selling Christmas cards when I was 11 or being in every organization I could be in and being active in the church. It was all a plan to get out of the house. And what that all led to was a whole bunch of people who taught me 
things about giving rather than getting. And those people actually ended up having as big an impact on me as my stepfather did. And uh, he taught me fear. They taught me hope. And I've always enjoyed trying to help others. And I never in business had a financial goal. My goal was always to somehow serve. And if it worked, it worked. And, and, and I think there's probably a lot of people on this call that it's the same thing. You, you end up doing well by, by treating people fairly. Yeah. And, um, and by the way, Wall Street is not really treating people fairly. So I'm in an area of education that is so absolutely simple to show people how they should be able to do better because others are not treating them fairly. Hmm. That's so great. So uh, let, if a hey, first off in the chat, if you if this message is hitting you in a good way, put the word me. And Paul, I can guarantee we're going to light this chat up right now. This is such a beautiful conversation. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and um, so, Paul, Wall Street is not treating us fairly. And and as realtors, too, a lot of people get into that. We have probably about 90% realtors in the call, mm -hmm. uh, probably about 10% of staff members. And, you know, as realtors, we get into real estate often because we I, I stumbled into it as a part time thing. A lot of people get into it for different reasons. And you get into real estate and all of a sudden you start earning a big commission check, right? Yeah. No one teaches you that that money is not all your money, that no one teaches you how to protect it. No one teaches you what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So if you could, I don't want to get, I don't want to make you teach an entire class at, uh, you know, 6 a.m. And by the way, is it, are you in Seattle right now? Or is it uh, Bainbridge, Bainbridge Island. Oh my God. Yes. Did we go to 3 a.m.? We could have. We could uh, thank you so much for waking up this early. I didn't know that. Happy, happy to do it. Oh my god. Um, so maybe just give us some quick pointers or some things like if you could wave a magic wand and have 212 people on this call learn two to three things, what would those things be? Well, the first thing I would teach them to do or suggest as aggressively as I can and still be nice <laughs> is to go get my free book. We're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. And that book is about those simple, every one of those 12 is a million dollar decision. We don't realize it because most of us, uh, the well, your folks would understand the concept of, of compound growth, but, but most people really don't. Uh, they can't believe that a dollar a day over a lifetime. I've got a brand new granddaughter, less than two months old. We already have her set up to fund her Roth IRA. And all it takes is a dollar a day for, well, as a matter of fact, to, to age 65. And you've got probably, if you do it right, a $4 million retirement. Now, we know, of course, $4 million won't buy what it does today, but it is still this idea that right there in that early saving, the importance of early saving, and then obviously the big ticket item in our industry is that if you're going to invest for the long, long term, thinking, remembering that every extra half of 1% will turn into an extra million dollars over a lifetime. There is the period of accumulation, the period of distribution, and then there's the period of giving, whether you like it or not, after you die. And every half a percent will add about a million dollars. So where can we pick up an extra half a percent? <coughs> if you just make the decision to put equity stocks in your portfolio instead of bonds. And I'm talking about passive investing here, not active investing where you're managing real estate, but we're talking about something that goes on, a business that's working while you're sleeping. And, and, and so that one decision, stocks versus bonds, historically has a 5% extra return per year over time. Now, if a half a percent means an extra million, it starts sounding like that one decision in and of its, the, itself is a multi-million dollar decision. Mm -hmm. And certainly to the extent that you want to do it as effectively, as efficiently. And I will tell you, I started in this business in the mid-60s. 
And I know now that it is more efficient to invest with index funds, with ETFs, low expenses, huge, massive diversification, tax efficiency. All these things are built to be better for you as long as you know the decisions to make along the way. One of those is to use index funds instead of actively managed. One is to do it, of course, if you can in a Roth IRA. Many of you make too much to do that. But if you can to do it in a, in a Roth IRA, they're all simple. They're all forks in the road that every one of us will take by design or by default. My hope is that book and, and, and a, a little more education is going to help you make each one of those decision points in your best interest, not somebody else's. Hmm. That's so great. Um, and I'm so motivated to read the book. And I think a couple of people might have put it in the chat as well. Um, so I definitely I'm going to challenge every single person on this call to read that. Um, so as as the parent of a 10 and a 12 year old, mm. what are what are some, you know, I, obviously, uh, what, or what are some easy ways that I can start to teach them about money and management? And you know what I mean? Like, not just like, oh, I dad, I want that shirt at Lululemon that kind of thing. You know, can I have money? Right? Yes. Like, how can I, as a parent, show up in a way where I'm not overwhelming them or boring them, but we're actually, but I'm, I'm giving them some interest in the education around fun. Because I, I grew up poor, you know, so when, when you're poor, you just are, you're in survival mode at all times, yeah. right? Dollar in is like dollar 25 out, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you're in this like sliding debt. Now that I'm not in that situation, you know, it's always a challenge to me to, teach the lessons I learned as a poor kid to my, my privileged kids. Right. But, but I, so I want, I don't want them to struggle, but I also want them to learn. How do you walk that line? Does that make sense as a question? I know it's a long winded. Yeah. And you can imagine that a lot of it uh, is going to be based on that child. And yeah. so when you, when you <laughs> ask for guidance on how to teach these young people, well, if I if I spent a half an hour with the child, I might have some ideas. But I can tell you that the surveys, the studies show that teachers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, parents who who mentor their kids by how they act, mm -hmm. you can make kids a part of the process. You can you can you can teach them simple thoughts uh, about about money, about how much we. When we make money, how much we save, how much we give, uh, and how much we enjoy. And if people start thinking like that when they're young, it has a tendency to, to, to stick. Parents teach kids more than teachers teach kids about financial information. Having said that, if you want to have a guest on your show sometime in the future, Tim Ranzetta is the absolutely best at educating young people in the country. Tim Ranzetta has an organization called Next Generation Personal Finance. He has a, a budget of about $6 million a year, which he himself covers. He runs it, charges nothing. He charges nothing for the curriculum for six grades through the 12th grade and will even pay schools to install the curriculum so that they will get this information coming uh, out of college or out of high school. But yeah. next, ngpf.org is one of the best sites that I know. Having said that, a book, Financially Fit Kids by Jolene Godfrey, is marvelous because you're talking about kids a certain age. What Jolene has written is a book, and it was written many years ago, about what kids should know at different ages and how you can teach them. <coughs> I, my, my, I teach high school classes, yeah. and, and it, and, but in a sense, I'm not saying it's too late, but it's hard for kids to understand what Warren Buffett would have them do with a one-liner is don't save what's left over after spending, but spend what's left over after saving. Mm. If you actually could believe that and put it to work, you've got the foundation for a lifetime of investment success, 
as long as you teach the other lessons, I think, that are all very simple. There's nothing that I teach that I can't teach to high school kids. They all get it. Yeah. And, and a lot of them, after they listen to me, they go out and open up a, an account at Fidelity with no minimum, with no commissions, with no expenses. I mean, it's, it's amazing what's out there for the, for the smaller investor. Yeah. And again, it's that efficiency that we have today that we didn't have when I came into this industry. And, and the sooner we can get them involved, uh, the, I think the better off they're going to be. Obviously, you can at 10, 11, 12, 13, you can put your kids to work. You cannot just give them an allowance and expect to deduct that in essence or have that count as income for purposes of a Roth IRA. Yep. But what you can do is you can give them jobs. You can have them mow the lawn. I had somebody send me a picture. They were Their six-year-old had a helmet on and he was mowing the lawn and they were paying him and they were putting the money matching the money, let him have the money, but matching the money in a Roth IRA. Yeah. There are all sorts of little things that we can do to, to, to involve them. In fact, some parents even involve their kids in, in paying the bills. Mm. And, and one of the first things they give, the lesson is for the really young ones, you let them seal the envelopes when the check goes in. I mean, they, it, it's very simple stuff. Uh, that 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 works, but you know it means that we have to oftentimes reorient our thinking from greed to need or whatever that might be called, and yeah. and, and show them that. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's interesting. Mark Silver put in the in the chat what are checks like? I think our kids are uh, we are getting into that mode where money we don't even know where our money's going, right? And <clears throat> and it, that allows for the fees the commissions the the like the little things that eat away at the savings to to, to go it's really interesting to, to be in this conversation um what what is one of the most common challenges you see with with people and i all these lessons you probably can teach high school kids i guarantee you can teach all these you know realtors on this call as well <laughs> so um, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see with anyone at any age making around money? Well, there are a lot of myths around investing. I mean, that's the area of money that I know. Yeah. And those myths are <laughs> uh, a, a fortune. I think something like 23% of millennials don't want to put money in the stock market because it's risky. It's a speculation. It's like gambling. Well, that is not true. Yes, you can treat the stock market uh, like you're going to Vegas, but that's not investing. Investing is, is, is treating your money with respect in ways that the past at least teaches us. And that's all we have is the past to know that over the long term in a diversified portfolio, that, that it always has worked always has worked. Now, by, at the same time, what's interesting to know is over that period that we call always, which really isn't always, it's going back to the 1920s, yeah. but and that then you, you have to face the depression and all of these uh, uh, interesting hurdles that, 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 that we faced. But, but, but the fact is, is that when we look at 40 years, while half of the companies fail, I mean, this is I think this is really interesting that so many companies have failed historically, but just owning the market has always succeeded yeah. so that you can own Washington Mutual and Eastern Airlines, the Enron. You can be a shareholder in all of those and still receive that 10% compound rate of return. Now, obviously not every year. So people often, by the way, have unrealistic expectations. And we have teachers online who will mislead you. There are people who will tell you the average return of the stock market is 12%. Well, that may be the average, but you don't make money on the average. You make money on the compounded rate of return, and that is 10%, not 12%. And I only mention that because if you have unrealistic expectations, the market is not going to is not going to support you 
and your hopes. It's like, I'm just sure there's somebody on here who knows somebody who got into cryptocurrency. And the reason they got into cryptocurrency because it was a way to get rich quick. As a matter of fact, talking about this guy being poor in the early days, it was easiest to encourage people who were poor to put money into cryptocurrency, just like it's easier to get people who are poor to put money into lottery tickets, even though the odds are so much against you and in, in the long-term success. So the key is, I think, to invest in a way that you control. As a matter of fact, I think that's an important aspect of the work that, that, that you share with people from what I saw. It's, it's about taking control of the things you can control. And when it comes to investing, every really great step that you take is going to be defensive, not offensive. Broad diversification. See, a lot of people think, and this is wrong, that if I have five or 10 or 20 stocks, I'm well diversified. If you have five or 10 or 12,000 stocks, you are well diversified. <laughs> yeah. And that's an important lesson because what happens? You get the same or a better return with more companies and you take less risk than you take with few companies. Yeah. When you invest in mutual funds that have low expenses. And now there are some funds that are actually free. Fidelity has a handful of index funds that are free with no minimum. I mean, think of the, of the efficiency for you as an investor over a lifetime, because people do not understand that 1% a year coming out of your hide into somebody else's pocket is going to likely over a lifetime become worth somewhere between one to $5 million. Yeah. So you pick up, you buy a fund with high expenses. You have that expense forever. I have been on a diet since the fifth grade. <laughs> I have lost over 4,000 pounds and I'm still overweight. I mean, this is like, paying extra expenses every year. I mean, my body is, is, is not doing as well as a slim body that's in shape that, that meditates every morning, I'm sure, and eats the right thing. Again, there are steps that you can take to be a better, more than likely person in your health life, and you can do the same things in your wealth life. If you just stop and think, is this in my best interest for the long term? One of the mistakes people make is they start, they say, I don't believe in market timing. I don't believe you should be getting in and out of the market. And yet what they do is they use the most famous market timing system of all. It's called the I can't stand it anymore. The ICSIA strategy. They just get overwhelmed and they believe they're going to go broke if they continue doing what they're doing. Yeah. And in fact, for young people, there's nothing better than a bear market. There is yeah. nothing more rewarding in the long term than buying. It's just like buying a house. I mean, yeah. what a what a great opportunity to get them <laughs> very cheap. And as you all know, they're easier to sell when they're dear than when they are when yeah. when they're cheap. And we need to turn that around and have people understand lower is better for yeah. the long term. That's great. So, Paul. We have some uh, some very young uh, people on this call, quote unquote, in their, I, I don't want to even say their ages, but they're young at heart, but maybe not young as far as the years are. And what advice do you have for people who maybe have not done any investing to the, you know, in their, in their 50s or 60s or any age, really, right? But you're sort of a little bit, you know, further along. Once again, young at heart, So I know I see all you guys in the chat. Um, what advice do you have for people who are, um, you know, a little further along in their, the count of their years that have not really started to invest, but, but are um, hearing this call and inspired, how should they start or what should they focus on? Well, the, the one question is, should they increase the amount of money they're saving? That seems like a first step is, is to save more. And that means for a lot of people, if they're not saving, and by the way, when I was an investment advisor, and I was, I did that for 30 years, I dealt with a lot of realtors. 
And I will tell you that they are in a business where they see it as a way of saving for the future. And so they would put money aside in something that had day-to-day -day volatility. And it didn't take very long for them to find out that that was not comfortable for them. Yeah. They really liked the long-term comfort of the, the real estate investment. So I'm assuming that this is somebody who doesn't want to put all their extra money into real estate. But obviously, the decisions have got to be the same, except it means you're going to play catch up by saving more. Then the question is, okay, how aggressive should you be? Well, I can tell you there are mutual funds that are called target date funds that will tell you exactly how aggressive you should be because they're built with your retirement date in mind. So if you're very young and you put your money into a target date fund that in essence matures, it doesn't mature you know, like a bond matures, but that they expect you to actually retire in 2065, they'll have you mostly in stocks today. Then they should. If you are 50, they're likely going to have you maybe more like 70% in equities. And as you get older, they will automatically add more fixed income to, to, to modify your volatility and your risk. And that is, in theory, what you're supposed to be doing. But if you are behind, you may say, I'm never going to get there. I mean, most, I think it's something, again, like 25% of people feel the only way they're ever going to be financially independent is to win the lottery. Mm. Well, if you start getting aggressive and trying to make up for lost time, you're at risk more than likely, actually, to end up more behind rather than getting where you're trying to go. Yeah. I also think that uh, some people just have to decide, and it's easy in your industry, I think, to plan to work forever. Yeah. I know lots of people who worked into their 70s. I loved working until I was 70, and then I started working again. And, <laughs> and so there's nothing wrong with working until we're 70 or even 80 if we love what we're doing. Yeah. And of course, you all love what you're doing when the market is good and not so much when the market is bad. And I understand it the kind of the same thing in my industry. But you have to make an adjustment. And for some people, it means you've got to get the religion of saving. And when you learn to be a spender, that is not easy because I'm at the other end of the spectrum. I am by nature a saver. Yeah. My spouse, love her dearly, but she is at her very core a spender. And sometimes in order to make this happen, the saver and the spender have to come to grips with the fact that as a team, they are going to have to to focus just on the saving. And then, of course, the challenge is, oftentimes the person who is in their 50s just getting started really doesn't want to have to take risk. They really wish they had parents that were wealthy and would leave them enough money to retire <laughs> because the idea of taking risk, it's just it's not something they grew up with. So it is kind of a one-at-a-time answer. And, and again, it's like with the kids, Sky, it kind of depends on what those kids are like. Some kids are natural savers. Yeah, They're yeah. squirrel stuff away. They don't know how to save other than hiding it, but, yeah. but, the, but they want you to pay the bill because they're trying to save. Other kids saving just, it, it is not yeah. part of their DNA, it appears. Yeah, it's so, so funny. Some, <laughs> sometimes I'll just say that what they need, yeah. they need a planner. Yeah. Planner who works by the hour, not a planner that takes a commission off you and has a conflict of interest or wants to build a lifetime annuity by charging you 1% a year to have them solve your problem. But yeah. somebody who will charge you, maybe it's going to cost $500 to $1,000 to get your life in order and start doing the right thing. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think uh, Eric put a great quote in the chat and uh, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. 
The second best time is today, <laughs> right? <laughs> Here's now. So for anyone on this call, it's hearing this, it's like feeling any kind of emotion. Don't feel that emotion. Just be motivated and feel the positivity that this is a movement, a change. And, and I think a lot of, there's so much power and energy and intention. Um, and as long as you, I think the other thing too about saving is once you start doing it, it almost becomes like, you don't even think about it. Like if the initial, like anything, working out, eating right, the initial ramp up and that initial phase is hard, but then it just becomes like part of anything else in life. And you just, it just becomes so natural. So it's really cool. So, well, and, uh, and, and I do think the idea of paying yourself first, we know this works. And the reason we know it works is that <coughs> we have found that people who go to work for companies that do not have a 401k plan or do not, if they have a 401k plan, do not have an automatic investment the day you come to work that you, you have to opt out versus companies where you have to opt in and make the decision. Yes, I want to save. Those companies that automatically opt you in without your permission and you have to opt out, those people tend to stay the course because they learn from day one what they have to live on. It's after I've saved. Yeah. And so somehow, how do we change who we are about the opt out or the opt in or the save versus the spend? And I would not be surprised to find out that somebody in this audience believes in affirmations and it may be that what you need is a set of affirmations that are, as you as you know, first person, present tense, add the emotion and make the commitment and do it for 21 days or whatever it is. You need some affirmations possibly to get you to get on the right track. Yeah, we have one or two people that do uh, some affirmations on this call. <laughs> I suspect so. <laughs> they may have done it before this call as well. <laughs> um, so, Paul, I, I am... I can't believe it's 6.45 already here. 3.45 for you, by the way. Um, I have so many more questions, but um, I, I do want to get you uh, on. Last question is more of a personal question. Um, Paul, What what's motivating you today? I mean, obviously, you've had a great career. Like you, You've given back so much. Like, What is it that's to this moment making you wake up at 3 a.m., by the way? Thank you for doing that. Um, but what is it that's that's driving you today that makes you so young? Well, I don't, I don't know how young I am, but I can tell you, I normally get up at this time. I, there's, okay. there's, there's no guilt trip there. Uh, yeah. I love getting up early. Today, truly, is about as good as it gets for me. Mm -hmm. Because today, I have this opportunity to change somebody's life. I, I don't know who it will be, but somebody will benefit in some way. Uh, I've benefited because I, I've learned some new things from, from watching your videos. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is uh, that will be followed this morning by a release of, a, of an article at Market Watch. Uh, in fact, it may, it may all, no, I'm sorry, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, uh, it, tomorrow morning, it will come out. Um, and uh, also a new podcast will come out tomorrow morning. Yes. I love the feedback we get about changing other people's lives. The fact that Eric recommended that you have me as a guest, this is huge to me. I, I, that is the biggest thank you that I could possibly have. Yeah. I do not have any need for more money. I, and that is what a luxury that is. But I do know one thing. I do know the investing process. I do know what's good for people. And most of the people who are out there helping others are doing it because they know how to do it. This is not work. This is the closest thing to play I could possibly do in my life because I'm doing what I did when people paid me 1%. Yeah, I'm yeah. helping them make decisions about something that I know. I do not know anything else, Sky. Yeah. I do not know how to fix anything. I do not. <laughs> I, I, I am... A, as, as I mentioned to Susie early on, I've never done an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. I am somebody who understands investing, and I believe I can help people see a better way than most of them are doing it right now. And the thing that they can like about me or not, 
is I'm not making any money. So I have no commitment to you. You could say that you'd rather have me charging you so I'd have a commitment to you. Well, I have, I could not have any more commitment than I have right now to educate others. Yeah. I just need to find more places like this to have the opportunity to share. And so it's what I love to do. I, I don't love to exercise. I, oh, I love to eat. Oh, I nice. really love to eat. If I'm sad, I love to eat. If I'm glad, I'm, I love to eat. I love to eat under any condition. So uh, that and teaching, those are the two, teach and eat. That's what I want to do. Beautiful. I love it. Well, if, if this call has impacted you in a positive way, or even you feel it may change the course of your life, put the word me in the chat. And I guarantee, uh, Paul, you've had a massive impact. And Eric, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. That is amazing. Uh, look at the chat light oh. up. And, um, and Paul, we actually have a West Coast group as well. So I'd love to bring you on the West Coast group more at 6 a.m. Pacific Coast time. So oh, that'd be okay. great for you. But <laughs> great. <laughs> That's wonderful. You made well, my I'll, day. I'll line you up on the West Coast as well. <laughs> and uh, and I just, it was it was a phenomenal call. I, in my head too, I, you know, I have some ideas. Uh, um, you inspired me with my kids. Um, my, it's so funny. You said that my, my daughter's the spender and my son is the saver. He's probably has, he probably has a thousand, 10 years old. He saved every single birthday present ever. And he's got this bank, like this locked bank. And he probably has like $800 in cash and he doesn't want to open a bank account. He likes looking at the cash in there, but this is going to motivate me to like influence him to, all right, God, here we go. <laughs> we're going to you let him read. We're talking millions when she's, when he's 18 or 16 years old, yep. he'll figure out what to do with that. Absolutely. So, yep. Absolutely. That's well, great. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Great call. The morning flew by and a uh, huge thank you to everyone on this call. If I don't talk to you on Thursday, happy holidays, everyone. And uh, just really, really grateful, Paul, for the call and the information. I am too. Very powerful. So thanks again, guys. Have a great day. Everyone. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. It was fabulous. Bye. What was Bye. the name? Holidays. What was the name of the book again? And where could we yeah. get it? Which one? We got a bunch. I'll put. I'll try to uh, send me an email. I'll try to get an email with a download. Of it's. Everything. I just put the link in the in the um, chat. Thank too. you, Elizabeth. Perfect. Perfect. Thank awesome. you, Paul. Excellent. And if you're an audiobook person, he also has a free ver audio version of That's it. That's right. Awesome. Eric, Don't thanks. forget, send it to your kids. My son's 25. I just sent it to him. So put it in a box. Oh, and we're now we're talking. And be like, uh, we are talking millions. Uh, Paul, he just great. got his master's degree yesterday. So he's oh. out in the world and it's the perfect time. Perfect. Thank perfect. you. Awesome. Uh, you're having right, a big guys. impact, Paul. Thank you. And thanks, Eric. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. All right, guys. Paul, I hope you feel good about yourself right now. <laughs> I feel great, as a matter of fact. I'm going to go have some breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.